Good morning, friends. I'm Dr. Ajay Shah and bringing you this another great live today. Today we have a special guest. Let me give you an update on our page first. We have now about 61,000 followers all over the world. Matter of fact, about 20, 25,000 from US. A lot of other countries are also having our followers. We are expanding on our pillars. Initially, we started with the six uh, pillars of healthy lifestyle, but I realized that a person who wants to be healthy also need to cover all the other aspects of life, including uh, parenting, relationship, and many other aspects. So you can read the pillars on, on my screen, on my background. Civic duty. Civic duty is a, a very important pillar. And we as Americans have to participate into our civic duties. We all have to vote. We all have to take uh, participation in a government. And that's a reason we are bringing various community leaders, various politicians, various members of Congress, and definitely various candidates to share their ideas on how we can make our nation healthier. We definitely are nonpartisan. We are looking for every community leader to come on our Facebook Live and, and to show us how we can make our nation healthier. Today, I have a great privilege to have Mike Detmer on our Facebook Live. Mike is a Republican candidate for the House of Representatives for the 8th District in Michigan, where I live uh, with my family. Mike has provided, actually, his pledge list, which I will quickly read so we know what, where Mike stands. Mike has said that in terms of Michigan economy, he will protect Michigan jobs and create opportunities in Michigan. Mike also has said that he will fight for the true healthcare reform and guarantee a lower cost for all of us in terms of healthcare. He definitely uh, is a big believer in Second Amendment. He also is very strong in securing our borders. He also is very committed to help our veterans. He also is uh, uh, committed to protect the unborn and the voiceless. And he definitely one of the, my favorite person in terms of having term limits for, uh, for our Congress. So those are his pledges. His pledges are available on his uh, website and on his Facebook page. But let me be very clear. We are inviting all the candidates to come on our Facebook Live, and we definitely are nonpartisan. We have invited Alisa Slatkin, uh, incumbent representative for, uh, for, uh, for uh, eight district, who is a Democrat, and hopefully she will come also. So let's all of us welcome Mike today. Welcome, Mike. Thank you for having me. That's great. So I'm gonna start with simple uh, things to know you, who you are. So where did you spend your formative years and who influenced you when you were growing up? Well, I grew up in Northern Michigan, a small town called Fife Lake, which is near Traverse City. And you know, my, both of my parents were entrepreneurs. We had uh, Christmas tree farms, they had a small real estate office. And my grandparents were also up there. They lived about a mile down the road from where I grew up. So I spent a lot of time with, with my dad, with my mom. I was around their small businesses. I worked in the family Christmas tree business. I spent time with my grandparents who were married for over 50 years. And really learning how to be a man came from my dad. My dad was probably one of my biggest mentors. Um, he taught me that you're your word is your bond. And when you shake somebody's hand and you give them that word, that's all you have because life can take everything away from you, but your integrity cannot be taken. You have to give that freely. And so that was, that was huge for me growing up. My grandparents also instilled that same philosophy. They, they were uh, very much old school. You do what you say you're going to do and you complete the task no matter what. So that was, that was really important for me. We had family dinners at home when we could. Uh, and if I had to stay with my grandparents, we always sat down at the table, we said a prayer. Um, you know, and that's, that, was, that was very, very important to my upbringing. And I think that really shaped who I am today. Uh, to just be bold and to be honest and to be true and to hold your word. And that's what I've put forth in this campaign. What you mentioned with my contract with Michigan, those line items, it's not just platitudes and talking points, but when you go into my website, I've actually detailed plans on how I'm going to attempt to tackle each of these things. So it's real easy for any candidate to say, well, I'm going to change the world. Okay, how are you going to do that? Is it perfect? Probably not. Uh, will there need to be changes to get the end result? Probably. 
Is it going to be easy? No, none of it's going to be easy. It's going to be very, very hard. But I believe you come to the table with something, you hold yourself accountable, and you make yourself accountable to the people that are employing you, and that's the voters. No, I think that's an excellent point you made, that uh, in leaders and in our politicians, uh, we definitely look for integrity, for honesty, being a friend type of person, and having some uh, strong family values and strong family roots. And I think you definitely represent those. So I think that's a great, uh, great uh, person to be. Uh, can you a little bit tell us about your early work? What kind of service and what kind of uh, things you have done for our society, for our district, for eight district? And, uh, and, uh, and why are you actually running for the office? Well, I'll start with the last question. I'm running because I'm a voter that's kind of fed up with uh, the mess that we're in. And you have a choice as a voter. You can either go vote for somebody that you hope will hold to the same values that you have, or you can step into the game. So this wasn't something that I had always dreamed of doing. Um, this is something that to protect my kids' future and hopefully my grandkids someday, uh, that's the selfish aspect for running is, is I want to go fight. I want to go fight to preserve our traditions and our freedoms. Um, beyond that, going back to the rest of your question, uh, I've spent my entire life working hard for my family. And one of the things a lot of people don't realize about me is I'm an avid outdoorsman. And that was something that my father took me out outdoors. He taught me to be a hunter. Um, and so I have mentored a lot of young people, including my own kids, on getting out, enjoying the outdoors, enjoying nature, respecting it. Plus, it's a great way to get some exercise and some fresh air. Definitely, definitely. I agree with you. Uh, so let me ask you uh, currently a very hot topic. Lately, in Michigan and all around the country, we all are going through a question whether we should reopen the schools or reopen the businesses in a what way. And that's kind of a really hot topic. Hospitals are open, but in terms of the school and different businesses, what are our views on that? Well, the first step that I would take, I'm a, I'm a constitutionalist, so I have to look at, does the government have the authority to shut down churches or places of worship and businesses? And nowhere in our constitution does the government have the authority to do that. So uh, if I was in a position of our governor, for instance, I, my first step would not have been shutting down our businesses. Um, and I, you know, hindsight's 2020, and we can have the argument all day long of how serious COVID is. I think it is a, a nasty virus. But is it any more nasty than H1N1 was? And we didn't shut down the world for that. Uh, I don't think it is. Um, so we have to look at what would have been done differently. I certainly wouldn't have done that, uh, just from a constitutional standpoint to start with. Shutting down places of worship, number one, that infringes on our First Amendment rights. You can't do that. What should have been done is encouraging people to do things that are safe. I've been saying this from the get-go. If you want to wear a mask and you want to protect yourself, wear a mask. If you want to wear gloves, wear gloves. If you are a business and you want to require your patrons to wear a mask, wear gloves, wherever, whatever protective measure you want, that's up to each individual business to make that decision, just like it's up to each individual consumer to enter that business. If they don't want to do that, well, then don't do business there. So we, we can't take away freedom. There's no asterisk at the bottom of our Bill of Rights that says all of these apply except in time of, of a pandemic. It, it doesn't exist. So that's the first litmus test for me is, are, whatever we're doing, is it unconstitutional? If the answer is yes, then we shouldn't do it. We need to find another way to solve the problem. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. Our constitution has gone through many, many crises and many, you know, uh, pandemics also, and it has survived. And I think I agree with you. I think freedom is number one important right of all of us. And that applies to businesses, applies to all the corporations. Uh, I think, uh, I think uh, uh, like uh, my question always is that, you know, we already have a, a, a representative in our house. And whenever we have any candidate, my question to them is, how can you be different and how can you be doing anything differently than what Alyssa Stotkin is doing? Well, for the first year of her term, Alyssa didn't do a whole lot. And she really, uh, when she campaigned two years ago, she told the voters of the 8th District that she was going to be their voice. She was going to represent everybody, not just the Democrats. And when you look at her voting track record, she hasn't done that. This, the 8th District is a plus four Republican district. So you have to take that into account. I don't care what party you're with, you have to listen and respect views from the opposing party. 
doesn't mean you have to agree. And it goes back to my original stance. You agree where you can, you disagree where you must, and you build on what you have. Alyssa hasn't done that. And in light of COVID, she's back this governor. And the, our governor, in my opinion, has with her executive orders, and we see when she, every time she writes an executive order a couple of days later, a day later, she's having to amend it. Um, they're unconstitutional and they're arbitrary. We've shut down Main Street, Michigan, but we left big box stores open. Why do we do that? Why would a small business have to suffer, but Walmart doesn't? You know, these things need, that's part of the problem. And Alyssa's backed this up. Alyssa has backed our governor all the way. Uh, she has not been there for the people. On the contrary, I've been out in public for months trying to educate the people of Michigan what's going on, trying to get businesses to open back up. I've had many small businesses back when everything was closed down tell me, you know, Mike, we, we're going to go out of business if we can't open our doors. But if we do open our doors, the governor's threatened to take our license away. And so my argument is, well, then what do you have to lose? Open your door and do business. Try to salvage what you have because this is your livelihood and deal with the licensing issue later. You'll win that fight, but open your doors. And so I've been out there actively trying to protect this state because the cure can't be worse than the disease. Alyssa Slotkin hasn't been anywhere. Uh, she's kept her head low, just like most elected officials in both parties across the state. And it's frustrating. I see the frustration in people's faces. They want to go back to work. They want to get their businesses back operating. And now that most businesses are back open, now there's this threat that they might get shut down again. Um, we, can't, we, we can't go this route. Our state and our nation was not built to be closed. We have to open up. We have to do it safely and responsibly, but we need to get back to business. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, and again, let me ask you, what are your views and what are your thoughts on so far what our governor has done? You partly covered that. And definitely what our president has done. I think obviously whenever we have this kind of crisis in the country, both governor and president's role is very important. So please tell us, what do you, what do you rate both of them when it comes down to taking care of this pandemic? Well, I look at what for, we can go from the top down, what the president's been doing uh, and then what our governor's doing really across the country. We have all of this conflicting information and we have for months. Um, we have some doctors and, and people that are experts in the field saying one thing, and a lot of them are being censored. And then we have other doctors and experts and virologists on the other hand saying something completely different. And for people that I talk to when we're out this is frustrating. What do we do? Uh, do we do we go on with life or do we stay at home? Um, so I would rate that as a, a little bit of a failure to at least get consistent, concise, real, accurate information out to the public. If you give information to the public, I believe that people will do what they need to do to protect themselves and their families and their businesses, but give us the right information. Now, the next question is, is it the government's job to do that? It really isn't. So it comes down to the individual. Uh, I would call upon the scientific community to come together and give us the real story, give us the real facts, so that way we can make real good decisions on how to conduct ourselves. Yeah, I think I agree with you. I think it comes down to individual taking responsibility. And I think uh, governor uh, and president can only guide us, but they cannot force us to do what we should be doing. So right. let me ask you the next question. I think there's a big fear of uh, uh, on election day you know, spreading this infection. So there is a big push to do a mail-in voting. Obviously there are plus and minus of both, uh, both ways in terms of mail-in voting. What are your views on mail-in voting? Well, I'll tell you what, mail-in voting is a scary proposition. We've seen, uh, and this has happened for years and years with absentee ballots. I think that is a major, could be a major catastrophe. I've even talked to other people running for Congress in other states that have had where their states have really pushed the mail-in uh, voting proposition. And it's, uh, it's rife with disaster. You've got lost ballots, you've got fraud, you've got voting vote tampering. Uh, it just makes it much easier for those who want to do something like that to do it. Um, so I would really encourage that polling places be open. An example of this, our governor here in Michigan just passed another or just wrote another executive order uh, limiting people to no more than 10 inside of a building, but voting places don't apply. Okay, well, that's great, but why would it not apply in a voting place if it applies if you're going to go to a small store in, in Main Street, Michigan? Uh, it doesn't make any sense. So again, people need to take precautions, but at the same time, we must have in-person voting. 
if if we go to all male and I and I and I'm going to this this may upset some some of your viewers, but I believe that there are elements in both parties that believe a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. And too often we see people in the establishment use situations like this and use fear to uh, push forward their own agenda. And I really believe that there is there has been a big push, especially from the Democrats, to get rid of in-person voting and do mail-in voting. And I just, I have a problem with that. Let's not use fear in this virus to push that agenda. Let's leave it open. A lot of people want to go vote in person. They feel better about it. It's, it's more secure. Uh, and people right now, I just talked to some folks yesterday that had just filled out their ballot and they were going to put it in the mail. And I encouraged them, look, if you're going to do that, at least drop it off at your township or your city clerk's office. Most of them have drop boxes that you can just put your ballot right in. Don't put it in the mail because there's too much, there, there are too many um, elements there, too many loose ends that uh, could really mess up the vote. All right. Uh, now, my next question to you is, uh, you know, obviously we are going through this uh, healthcare crisis with this pandemic, but this crisis is not new. I think we have crises of a lot of chronic disease, including diabetes, heart disease, cancer, and some of those uh, crises actually are not, uh, uh, not going away. They've been around for 100 years. So what is your feeling in terms of uh, prevention as uh, taking care of this, some of this chronic disease? And what do you think, uh, whether a single payer healthcare system like Canada, is it something uh, our country should try to adopt? Or do you still believe that uh, we should continue with this uh, uh, various insurance companies and Medicare? Well, start with the first part of your question. Yeah, there are so many other elements, which is the human condition. We've in it, it most of these diseases, a lot of these diseases we're finding out have been around for thousands of years that we as, as, as people have been fighting and, and struggling against. Does that mean that you shut down everything because something new comes along? No, I, I don't believe so. Are people going to die from COVID? Yeah, especially those who are immune compromised. But are, there all, are they also going to die from the flu? Most likely. Are they going to die from heart disease or diabetes? I just lost my brother here recently, uh, actually two weeks ago from diabetes. So, I mean, there are all these things out there, but I don't think you stop. As far as your, your question on single payer healthcare, that's disastrous. Canada is a different story. Canada's got one tenth of our population in this country. We're looking at some of the estimates I've had, and I think one of the lower estimates is three and a half trillion dollars a year for single payer healthcare. So I've posed this question to some of my uh, friends on the other end of the spectrum politically, uh, I said, okay, if you're going to push forth single payer, what are you going to cut? What entitlements are you going to get rid of to pay for that three and a half, I'm sorry, three and a half trillion dollars. If I said billion, that's wrong, but three and a half trillion dollars. Hopefully I didn't get muted right there. Uh, so the, the question is, what are you going to cut to pay for that three and a half trillion dollars? And they can't give me an answer. So if you're going to do that, then you've got to give up something. I don't think that's the answer. One of the things I rolled out with my health care plan is getting health care out of the hands of the federal government, giving it back to the states, giving it back to doctors and their patients, opening up a true free market system. And when it comes to insurance, open up insurance across state lines, let people shop. Uh, you've got to have some a little bit more truth in advertising. Drug costs are another big issue. Uh, and that's another whole topic. But I'll, I'll, let me just touch on that for a second. A lot of candidates will say, well, we want to have lower drug prices. Okay, how are you going to do that? One of the things in my plan is, and one thing that's, that's true, is you've got big pharma in this country who have lobbied Congress for years to pass really strict regulations, which has made it cost prohibitive for smaller drug companies to be able to compete or operate. If you look at Puerto Rico just 10 years ago, 15 years ago, Puerto Rico had quite a few smaller drug manufacturers there. They're all gone. They're gone from across the country because big pharma has lobbied Congress to eliminate their competition. So the first step to bring drug prices down is you've got to get back to a free market. You've got to gut these nasty regulations, which prevent, prevent smaller manufacturers from being able to, being able to operate. If you, if you want to open up a small uh, pharmaceutical company and you want to create a new vaccine, for instance, or you want to create a, a new drug to cure whatever, you have to have per regulation everything in place to be able to manufacture it uh, at a marketable uh, quantity. And that's cost prohibitive. You can't do that. 
you've got to start small. So it'd be like if you're going to go build a car, the regulation would be, well, you've got to have a whole factory built. You can't just have a prototype. You've got to have an entire factory built ahead of time. You've got to have everything permitted. You've got to have everything set up to be able to mass produce this. Uh, and if you don't, well, you can't be in business. That has to change. Once we have competition back into the private sector, now all of a sudden you're going to see other companies now competing, which will bring prices down for drugs. That's the solution. Yeah, I think uh, that makes sense. Uh, so, you know, we are going through this big economic uh, downturn right now, state-wise and country-wise in the whole world. I think whenever we look for any candidate, we always look like how that candidate will make difference to our bottom line, which typically is what we earn and how we can be financially secure. So what do you propose or what are your thoughts on how to come out of this economic downturn for small businesses or individuals and for everybody? Yeah, well, the, the first mistake that a lot of candidates make is, is claiming that they're going to create jobs and government does not create jobs. What government does is it hinders growth. It, it hinders private sector growth by over-regulation or being too burdensome on taxes or anything else. So the first step is, is that you have to go fight to keep taxes low, but mainly get regulations, deregulate, get off of the back of small business. That's what has to happen. The federal government and even the state government needs to get off of the back of small business. Let businesses thrive. Michigan's been losing population for decades. We're probably going to lose one congressional seat in the state, at least one, maybe two, because of the amount of people who have left the state. Well, why are they leaving? They're leaving to go to other states that are a little bit more friendly. Companies that are leaving other states like, well, from like Michigan, New York, California, they're moving to states like Texas. They're moving to the Carolinas. They're moving to Florida. We have to change that. So we've got to be smart. We've got to advocate for deregulating, getting off, of, off the back of business and inviting more companies and industry to come back to Michigan, which brings jobs. That's what government can do. That's what government's role get out of the way of free market. Um, but there's really nothing other than that, that gov every time government tries to get involved in, in our marketplace, they screw it up. So I'm, I'm a big proponent of getting out of the way and, and having that fight to get out of the way of businesses and, and, and jobs. All right. Uh, my next important question is that, you know, we always look in a candidate that who is supporting you in terms of uh, people, in terms of uh, communities, in terms of businesses, in terms of the other organizations. So who are your endorsements? And please tell us about, you know, what, who they are and what they represent. My very first endorsement was from State Senator Patrick Kolbeck. And, and for me, that was a huge endorsement. He's somebody that exudes integrity. He's a Christian. Uh, he's been battling really the establishment for his entire political career. He ran for governor a couple of years ago. Uh, for him to get an endorsement from somebody like that, he doesn't endorse very often. But when he does, he spends a lot of time vetting candidates and he endorses people that have integrity. And the next big endorsement was Sheriff Clark out of Milwaukee. Um, he spent a long time asking very hard questions, vetting me before he endorsed, and he doesn't endorse. A lot of the people, and if you go to my social media pages, you can see all of these endorsements. Well, most of the people who have endorsed me don't endorse candidates, and these are people that are, um, you know, pillars in the in our community. They're they're pillars in our state and in our in our in our country. Um, some organizations that I got endorsed by: Right to Life of Michigan, Michigan Heartbeat Coalition. Those are two opposing pro-life groups, and I'm the only candidate who was endorsed by both. Um, the National War Council. I've got many of these groups out there that have endorsed, and it's just, it's such an honor. It's humbling, really, to have that much faith and confidence put on uh, by these different groups and individuals. It's, um, it really is a humbling experience to have them have put that much faith in. Wow, that's great. My next question is a very simple, very uh, uh, common question. We always look in a leader that who actually leads them. So who's your favorite president and tell us why? Well, I have Ronald Reagan on my cell phone. So every time my phone rings, uh, Ronald Reagan pops up. He was the great communicator. And one of the reasons that he had so many Democrats actually vote for him along with Republicans is that he was able, he didn't pander. And he was somebody that would just, he, he was who he was. You could count on that. You understood that what he said he meant. 
And uh, I think that that garnered a lot of respect from Americans. But he also, through his communications, let the American people know that we are that shiny city on the hill. It, he reminded us that we are, we should be proud of who we are, be proud to be an American. We're the greatest nation that the world has ever seen. We're the freest nation that the world has ever seen. What we have is a true gift. And whether you're a believer or not, I believe this is one of the greatest gifts from God to have our nation. We need to fight to protect it. We have to fight to protect those freedoms. And that's what Ronald Reagan did. So as far as, and I would say, uh, president Trump is probably, uh, is probably number two on my list. As far as a modern president, he's rough. And there are a lot of people that he's, he is divisive, but again, he's somebody, there's no mystery to this man. He doesn't have to be there. You may not like him, but he's, he's going to do what he says he's going to do. And that goes back to my childhood. You mean what you say and say what you mean and follow through with it because that's all you have. So these two presidents, uh, to me exude integrity. Uh, from that standpoint, they're honest. And you know who they are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, what are your views on Second Amendment? Second Amendment's huge. And I believe that that, that one amendment, and it, it, if you notice the order, you have the First Amendment, and then the Second Amendment is the second most important in our Bill of Rights. But that gives the power to the people to be able to defend themselves against, themselves against a tyrannical government. So if the Second Amendment falls, everything is, is wide open. And we've seen that in other countries. Look at what happened in Venezuela, where they pulled the right to bear arms there, which wasn't, still wasn't as liberal, if you will, as ours was. And then not long after that, they had a total suspension of their constitution. So that allows us as an armed uh, citizenry to be able to defend against a tyrannical government. And I've been out there fighting. I, in fact, uh, here in Livingston County, I was part of the Livingston County 2A movement to make Livingston County a sanctuary county, meaning that we took a stand with the rest of the state and with the country that we are going to protect the Second Amendment, period. And I was the only candidate, I was the only, only person running for uh, U.S. Congress to be at every single meeting, to stand up for it, to speak on behalf, to lobby the, the, the county commissioners to get this passed. Before that, I stood on the steps of Lansing's Capitol in solidarity with patriots in Virginia when Virginia was talking about red flag laws and gun confiscation. So I'll, I've been out there actively fighting to defend our Second Amendment before I've been hired for the job to go do it. But I want the people to know that I'm going to fight just as hard, if not harder, in Washington, D.C. to make sure that not only do we protect the Second Amendment, not only do we stop these dangerous constitution killing red flag laws, but we also start to repeal a lot of the infringements. And the, there's a long list, which I've also posted on uh, different social media platforms, including Facebook, that I want to start to walk back. So it's not enough to just say, well, I'm just going, I'm going to stop, but I'm also going to push to uh, repeal a lot of this stuff. And again, it's going to be hard. There's nothing easy. You know, how do you eat a whale one bite at a time? And that's what I want to go do is start to walk things back and change this trajectory of taking people's guns away. All right. So my last question to you is that uh, please give us a summary, maybe three or four minutes long, why citizens in the eight districts should vote for you. And please uh, be as descriptive as you want, be how different you are compared to Alisa Slotkin. So tell us why we should vote for you. Well, first and foremost, I'm from the 8th District, and I, I grew up in northern Michigan. My parents moved me to Rochester Hills, which is part of the 8th when I was in high school. So I graduated from my high school at Rochester Adams High. I went to Oakland University. Uh, I met my wife in Rochester Hills. We got married in Rochester Hills. We started our family in Rochester Hills. We started our, our careers there, and we live here. So we, that's the first difference. Alyssa Slotkin is not from Michigan. She's not even from the 8th District, and she dropped in. And she, she won by a very thin margin. So that's the first dif difference. Uh, ideology, ideologically, we're completely different. We're 180 degrees different. Um, she came in under false pretenses in my, in my estimation. And I've talked to a lot of Democrats that are disappointed because they don't feel that she's represented them either. So she came in saying that she was going to be a moderate, that she was a moderate, that she was going to work on behalf of everybody. Sorry, I had a, another call coming in. I got good. Her voting record suggests that she's actually more liberal than AOC. That's a big feat. How do you do that? But she's managed to do that. 
Uh, she came out for impeachment against our president. That did not sit well in the 8th District. Uh, then she drafted legislation which would tie the president's hands in dealing with Iran. So all of the things that she said she would do, she has not done. Um, so that's where we're different. Uh, the other part of that is, is accessibility. You know, the, one of the, the pillars of my campaign is being open and accessible. I put my cell phone number out there for voters. Uh, I message with people. In fact, I, I'm usually up late every night because I'm responding to text messages and messages on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram from people. And that's going to stay that way. How do you represent if you're not accessible? One thing I'm not going to do is move to Washington, D.C. If you hire me for this job, I'll fly there every single week to do the business of our district. But my family's staying here. We're staying in district. And I'll be back every single weekend. I'm a voter. I'm, a, I'm an average citizen. I'm not a politician who's worked in Washington, D.C. their whole life. I'm just somebody who's tired of the stupid, to be quite frank. And we've got to change that. We've got to have somebody that actually has a game plan. You come to the table with something and you go fight. You go work every day. This is a this is a job. This isn't um, you're not being coronated. This is a job. And the voters are the employer. And I understand that. And I'm accountable to you. One of the other things that I just rolled out, too, as far as transparency goes, which very few people in Congress do, is I'm going to every single week or, or as new legislation comes down the pike, whether it's something that I'm writing and putting together or it's something that I'm going to be expected to vote on, I'm going to post every bit of legislation that comes in. And by the way, I'm going to read every bit of legislation that comes in because I like to do that. But I'm also going to put my take on what those bills are, and I'm going to ask for feedback from the public. And when I'm back in district on, on the weekends or when there are whole weeks where it's in district work, I'm going to be available for the voters to be able to have those important conversations because the voters are the employer. You need to know what's going on. In two years time, when it's time for reelection, there should be no question about what your representative has been doing in Washington, D.C. on your behalf. So that's what I've put forth. That's what I want to happen because that's important to me as a voter. I'm tired of uh, electing people to office and they hide behind the curtain. We've got to get people out. I want to pull that curtain back and at least let you know through what I'm doing, you'll also have a, a, a wide view of what's going on in Washington, D.C. at the same time. That's great. Again, thanks for coming on our Facebook Live. You know, I wish you the best. Uh, you seem to be a nice, uh, you know, nice person. And I think uh, we all need people who represent us uh, well in uh, in Congress. So wish you the best again. Thank you again. Uh, thank you. It's been an absolute honor and a, and a privilege. Real pleasure. Yeah, thank you.